That's good. Um, my name is Chon Noriega. I'm the director of the Chicano Studies Research Center, and I want to welcome you all to our uh, uh, second meeting of uh, what we're calling Friends of the CSRC Library. And our goal today was to begin something uh, that we hope will become an ongoing program uh, at the center, and it builds upon existing uh, resources that we have in the archive, and that has to do with photo collections. Many of the papers that we have from individuals, families, or organizations have uh, photographs within them that really are part of an unseen history in uh, our national culture, and even in, to some extent in our local uh, history here in Los Angeles. And uh, whether it's uh, family, uh, Ricardo Munoz, Jose Luis Sedano, uh, photographers like Oscar Castillo, uh, elected officials like Edward Roybal, um, kind of civic leaders, advocates like Dionisio Morales, elected officials like uh, Grace Montanez Davis, um, that in all of these we had something very unique. And, and when you spend time with these collections, you really get a sense of that, which is you have a visual corollary to the history that the documents uh, tell you about, that the letters and the papers and the other, uh, documents. But it also gives you a sense of the personal dimensions of that history. Uh, even with elected officials, what you're often seeing is the family life that is suddenly in the public, uh, public gaze. And we just actually recently met with a colleague of mine at another university, unnamed, uh, that, not public, um, <laughs> that brought in three, actually four generations of family photography going back to about 1910. And just the sense of being in the presence of that history is really quite, quite amazing. We have uh, four other collections here that were acquired by our uh, previous librarian, the late Yolanda Retter Vargas, who would go to flea markets and she would find family photo albums. And we'd have the family's last name, but we wouldn't know anything else about them. And so we have uh, the photo albums of four different families uh, spanning a period of time anywhere from the 40s up through uh, the 80s and 90s. And what we've been doing, and you see our, our main people here, Chris Velasco and Jenny Walters, is we've been digitizing them for the UCLA Digital Library so that these can be accessed and searched by anyone uh, with access to the internet. They can also come here and ask to see the, the actual photographs themselves. We've been fortunate to have support for that in terms of the public figures, uh, or in terms of the orphan photos, where we don't know much about the families. But what we're really excited about is beginning to broaden that out and to bring in a wider range of family photography to get the information um, that, that uh, the families have about the imagery, and to begin to round out the visual record of uh, the Mexican-American, the Latino population starting initially in Los Angeles, but ultimately looking much wider. Um, as you can imagine, many of the families uh, that are now in Los Angeles started in Arizona, or Texas, uh, New Mexico, and before that, Mexico. Um, so in the process, we really get a very important part of the history of the 20th century, uh, which is that of kind of northward migration. Um, I'm going to be turning it over to our librarian to tell you a little bit about what we're hoping uh, you'll be able to help us with today and uh, hopefully uh, take an interest and want to continue uh, contributing. But I want to first uh, acknowledge uh, our funder, our sponsor for uh, this evening's event, who's also uh, one of our donors uh, to the archive, and that is Ricardo Munoz. And he's here uh, with his brother um, with some more photos. And we're actually, he's part of a uh, uh, a grant that we just received from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, I must have died about a year ago because I never thought we'd get a federal grant. <laughs> uh, but in my afterlife, I'm quite pleased um, to have that support precisely to uh, process, to, to digitize, and to make accessible the papers and the images uh, related to uh, five rather phenomenal families and individuals uh, that give us new insights into uh, the history of, of civic participation, professional participation in the mid-20th century. It's not an end point, it's a starting point for us. And we're really excited 
um, not only that uh, the Munoz family has contributed to the archive here, and that we're able um, to make those materials available, including uh, extensive correspondence, uh, manuscripts written by, uh, by uh, Munoz brother's mother uh, and uh, grandfather, um, that really give that first voice account of what life was like in the U.S. throughout the 20th century from the point of view of the Mexican-American uh, community. And uh, Ricardo comes to everything we do. He's one of our biggest um, supporters. Uh, we're really proud to have the collection here. And when we thought of this event, in some ways, we were thinking of his collection and the other collections like it uh, that have been central to our effort to create a digital library here through UCLA. You have to realize that this center, we've been here 20, 42 years, we have our own archival holdings in the university. We're also the first uh, true, we're, we're, the, we're the contributors, the creators of the first true digital archive at UCLA uh, through the UCLA Digital Library uh, Project program. And that's the Frontera Collection of 78 RPM recordings in Spanish that are part of the musical and recording heritage of the United States. Uh, and those are online, and we just yesterday got the uh, book, and we'll circulate a copy, right, uh, Lisa? Yeah. Uh, of that, so you can see some of what we do with our collections. We not just make them available, uh, not just uh, make them searchable online, uh, but to produce new scholarship that helps convey the significance of these collections. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, Ricardo, but also invite him up to say a few words. Uh, from the perspective of a collection donor and somebody who's been a, an important part of our center. Well, I'm happy to be here and glad that we have a good turnout. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I find what's going on here at the center very exciting. And this is a, a new project. and. I think it's going to, you know, it, it really has such wonderful possibilities to, uh, for, for all our community to, to get involved and, and to uh, take advantage of the resources that are going to be here to digitize uh, a lot of, uh, of, of family uh, memories. Uh, and, and, and one of the things that, that I wanted to point out uh, uh, where you know, a great value is, is that in getting these uh, photographs digitized, that makes it possible for in the future for members of our families to, to uh, have access and to utilize them if they get inspired to, to write about, the, the, you know, your own family history. And uh, I know that, you know, that that's true because I have I have some props that I brought. This is a book uh, that my grandfather uh, wrote, and it's it's a history, a lot of the history of the family as far back as as he uh, had uh, information about it. And uh, there's some really old photographs in it uh, from you know from the uh, uh, from the 19th century. Some of them maybe. Uh, then I then I have. Two other cousins who, who uh, produced also history books. These were cousins from. Uh, they're not first cousins, but they're cousins from my uh, mom's side, and one of them uh, was from my grandmother's side, which was a terrazas, and the family grew up in Tucson. In fact, the family goes back to some of the original settlers of Tucson, so. Even in here, there's old family photographs that they they were able to utilize uh, for, you know, also giving a picture of a, a lot of the personalities that were written about. And then I had a, another cousin on my, my mom's uh, on her from her father's side, the Uria side, and one of my cousins uh, wrote a, a big history about the family and and used a lot of the photographs that they were able to to obtain that had passed down and hadn't been lost. So I see this as just, you know, it's a phenomenal asset to, uh, to our community. 
you know, I can see in the future, you know, we're going to be gone, uh, you know, but the, a lot of the, a lot of legacy will be left in terms of the story of, of, of what our families, what their lives were like, and, uh, and, and, and what challenges they faced in, uh, in their time. So anyway, that's that's my point. <laughs> well, thank you, and I, I must say the the Munoz family uh, are prolific writers. Um, it's a and it's kind of phenomenal. It's a family not only writing manuscripts, but just extensively writing correspondence, and it's precisely that uh, perspective on history that needs to be brought into the historical accounts of Los Angeles and the U.S. I should mention that uh, um, Ricardo's brother, Rosalio, here is also the first uh, Chicano who was elected to uh, the UCLA, uh, UCLA student president, but was also a major figure uh, and continues to be a major figure in terms of efforts towards social equity um, for Chicanos in Los Angeles. And uh, through social media, which I think is becoming a, the, the new kind of family or personal archive, is making a lot of these images available with, I think it's very important for the historical record, the, the personal memories of the commentary uh, on these images. We have here an image from one of our orphan collections. Uh, we don't know who this is. We know the name of the family. Uh, we know that this young boy has probably committed a crime recently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be going into hiding. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about the horse, actually. <laughs> yeah, the horse isn't going to move too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> since it has been frozen by the camera. But, uh, <laughs> But it's, it's the type of imagery, I think, that really breathes life into um, what is either a stereotype in many people's minds or just an abstraction about what must have been as, as a history. I want to show you this book, and we'll pass it around. This, uh, as I said, it's just hot off the presses. It's uh, from a series we do that um, where we try to connect a scholar or a writer to one of our archival collections to write the first history based on it. We've done that with self-help graphics. Um, and we've done that with the Latino Theater Initiative. We've also done it with uh, individuals like Oscar Castillo as a photographer, uh, Robert Lacoreta as, as a performance artist. And in this case, we're doing the Chris Strachwitz Frontera Collection, which we have digitized here, which is about 45,000 recordings of 78 RPMs from about 1904 to 1954. And you have to realize, during this time frame, the, the 78 RPM and the Victrola was the iPod in the first half of the 20th century. And we have a Victrola in our house that's been in our family. And it looks kind of like this. And in the front, you open it, it's got all the records. And then if you want to do the volume, you just open the, the thing there, you close it. It's got little wheels so you can roll it. So it's, it literally is like an iPod. In this is a, a musical heritage that you take around uh, with you and that you can play um, for your personal or family kind of edification or, or, or pleasure. And we thought it was important that this is now online uh, to provide a critical framework and a history of this recording. And we commissioned Augustine Gursa, who I think is one of the best um, music writers about uh, Latino and Spanish language music, to go on and do the research, to listen. He listened to almost all of these recordings and to, uh, to give us that history as a first pass so that we can then get this into reference libraries, we can get this into classrooms and begin the process of encouraging more people to come to this site and to use uh, the recordings. I'll pass this around. Um, before I bring uh, Lizette up here to kind of tell you what we're trying to do today, and uh, maybe begin a discussion and see what kind of questions you have uh, about the archiving process. We've got examples here, and we really want to share as much information about what an archive is, what we do to preserve materials and make it accessible, but also how we try to do something a little different uh, than a traditional library. We try to have that ongoing relationship and dialogue with the collection donors so that we can try to better understand and represent what the collection has meant to the individual, the family, or the organization, and make sure that that is there available for future researchers. A hundred years from now, uh, I may be the only person still here, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm being hopeful. Um, but we would hope to have oral histories, uh, audio recordings, transcripts of those who helped bring collections into the university uh, for future scholars. 
I want to just ask a few questions to get a sense of uh, kind of what some of you have brought here, just so we have a little snapshot. But uh, we asked uh, everybody to bring three photographs if you, if you could. How many of you brought a photograph from before 1950? Excellent, so we have three people. Uh, from the 50s through the 60s? And uh, 70s and 80s? Uh, 90s? And how about today, when you realize you had to bring three photographs? <laughs> <laughs> We're at a very interesting moment for the history of photography, for the history of the book, as we've moved into a digital environment. Um, I just had lunch with Harry Gamboa, a photographer, two days ago, and he told me he's going back to shooting in slides. Now this is, uh, like Harry, if you know him, he is a salmon. He swims up against the stream. And he's going against the current of what has happened to photography, which is it's largely become a digital format. Um, it's important to do both. Believe it or not, it's almost as likely that the uh, photographs that you've brought in uh, have a better chance of being here 100 years from now than some of the digital uh, materials that have been scanned uh, due to changing platforms, migration to them, and you lose a little bit. Our goal is to really work on both fronts. It's important to, to really uh, take every effort to ensure that the materials are accessible, that you can find them, and that you can use them. You can use them to uh, advance your knowledge and to produce new knowledge uh, that can change the understanding of what the history and culture of this country uh, has been. So now with that, I'd like to bring up Lisette Guerra, who's our librarian and archivist. Acknowledge that we have a special guest in the room who will um, be uh, part of the discussion, which is, uh, who is? Barbara Carrasco, uh, senior, the artist, uh, not the writer. Uh, <laughs> and uh, who's been uh, not only a Bruin, a graduate of uh, UCLA, but has also been a, a contributor to the library. She uh, did this work here that's hanging uh, by our entrance that was part of an award uh, developed here uh, at UCLA, uh, and has had, a, we have another work of hers that has been hanging uh, that will be returning soon once we change out our exhibition here. But I'd like to bring up Lizette, have her say a little bit about um, what, what we'd like you to do, and then see if you have any questions, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but to get a little peek into the archival process of what happens uh, behind the curtain with uh, our acid-free boxes and folders. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this will be your crash course, really, in how to do it yourself at home. Um, but I think it's important to to first talk a little bit about why save your photographs. I mean, believe it or not, like in my family, I'm also the family archivist, as I, I hate to say, but as my family members have passed on, you know, my cousins, second cousins, whatever, they always give me, you know, whatever they emptied out from their parents' home, be it photographs, papers, correspondence, almost anything. And, and they always say, well, you're into that stuff. So, you know, I've, I've also become the family archivist. But why save your photographs? Why is it important? So, um, in my opinion, there's uh, four primary reasons. So, to document your historical memories, not just um, your family's, but yours as an individual, um, you know, growing up, going to school, um, different, you know, activist activities that you might have been involved with, or your neighborhood history. Um, just your historical memory and along with that preserving you know those historical materials as Sean mentioned chances are you know these physical items these photographs tangible photographs are probably going to outlive you know the digital stuff so really to preserve those materials for as Ricardo mentioned for you know future generations um, and accountability uh, protecting your rights, you know, it, it's a historical record documenting something. So oftentimes, um, you know, people will consult archives, you know, as evidence of, you know, events or people or just different things. And lastly, to inform the future. You know, oftentimes um, underrepresented communities like Chicanos and Chicanos are left out of historical texts. And so by really collecting and documenting these materials, you know, we are providing a resource to, um, for scholars to write us back into um, those historical 
uh, books. So on that note, um, let's talk about the nitty gritty. So organizing your materials. Your first step is going to be find your materials. And I mean, that's that seems like a common sense thing, but I mean, you'd be surprised how uh, many families we work with that, you know, will call me periodically. I found some more stuff. I found some more stuff in another closet. I found some more stuff in the back of the garage. You know, sometimes we accumulate things and that's fine and we forget where we put things and or even what things we put away. So number one would be to find your materials. Um, attics, basements, garage, closets, drawers, the notorious junk drawers. Um, and not just at home, but also in your workplace, in your car. <laughs> um, storage facilities, a lot of people, you know, will get a storage, you know, space because they've run out of space at home and, you know, those are other um, locations you might want to um, check. And then step two would be to group your materials by type. That would be the quickest, you know, way to start, you know, so you'll do correspondence, you'll do photographs, you'll do, I don't know, financial records, and so on and so forth. Things that, you know, make sense, you know, as you, you start sifting through those boxes. Um, and then storing your materials appropriately. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to flesh that out um, more as, as I keep talking. Um, so filing drawers, you know, like, like the ones we have here, those are great for things that you're not going to, that you're, you know, going to be using frequently, you know, so um, financial records are, 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 are things that you can put in these drawers, things that you need to access all the time, and it'll help keep, you know, the stuff you need to preserve, like the photographs, separate from the um, things that you're going to be accessing. And then in archival boxes, that's where you want to invest the, the time and resources to put stuff like photographs or family correspondence, um, things that you're not going to be pulling out all the time, you know, so that they can, you know, um, be preserved. So how do we um, organize our photographs? Um, sometimes there's already an organization to our photographs. You know, maybe our family members already have albums, you know, documenting an event or a family member. Um, in those cases where there is organization already, we try to maintain that because there was a, a reason behind it. Um, but more often than not, there is no organization and things are, um, you know, just kind of all over the place in a box or under the bed or in the back of the closet. And I'm talking about myself. Um, <laughs> so um, if there is no order, then, you know, try to, you know, group your photographs. And sometimes, you know, we don't know everyone in a photograph or, you know, it's really hard for us to tell, you know, gosh, like, well, I don't know who these people are, even though they're family members. Um, something that we've had to do here is, again, organize them by, you know, type or by group, you know. So sometimes, you know, you'll start um, seeing people wearing the same thing, same background. You're like, okay, these go together. Um, or, you know, same hairstyle, or you use cars and their license plates, you know, to start dating, you know, materials. So again, just real rough grouping um, as you sift through things. And then name your stuff consistently and in a way that makes sense. Be, um, because sometimes, you know, at the moment you're like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna label this box this way. And then, you know, maybe a month from then you find another box and you've organized it, you've done a great job, but now you've named it something completely, you know, different and stored it somewhere completely different and now it's lost again. So be consistent, you know, in how you group things and how you label them. That's very important and be concise, you know, keep, keep your, your labels short. Um, so good examples would be, I don't know, a, a, a file that would say mom and dad's wedding, 
comma 1958. That's very specific. It's 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 all there. You know, just so you can if you run into that box or where you know where that box is, you'll be able to to identify the stuff inside the file. Um, or maternal great grandmother's childhood pictures. I don't know, 1927. You know, so, so just be consistent and to the point. And then when digitizing, back up, back up, back up. Because as Chon mentioned, things, you know, disappear, your computer crashes, and, you know, they're gone. So just, you know, back up your things on your hard drives, on external drives, um, because you never know. Flash drives. Flash drives, <laughs> what a, you know, DVDs, um, whatever works. Um, so, going back to organization, temporary records, don't invest too much money on, you know, the archival quality folders. I mean, standard file folders are fine because, again, you're going to be accessing these things often. So, really invest your resources on the things that um, you're not going to be, go ahead and pass these around, that you're not going to be accessing all the time. So photographs, for instance, you would want to use um, archival quality file folders like the ones I'm passing around. And these are um, acid-free and lignin-free. I don't even know if I pronounced that correctly, sorry. Um, but, you know, I did um, provide everyone with a vendor list that, that sells archival quality boxes and file folders and sleeves. And you can find any of these materials you know, on any of those sites, and um, you don't have to be an institution to purchase from them. And these are the best. They have um, the ones with the tabs that don't go all the way to the end. You want to use the full tab, you know, folders because it's it's a lot sturdier than having the 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 partial tab where things can rip. Um, you also have more space to label your folders, which is important. And again, be concise and be consistent um, with how you label everything. Um, and some people might disagree with me on, on, on this, but um, I know when I was trained, it was okay. Um, lightly penciling information on the back of photographs is okay. You're not gonna ruin the photograph forever, um, but use good judgment. Sometimes our photographs are falling apart. Probably not the best idea to write on that particular photograph, but something that, you know, is in, in good condition. As long as you're not, you know, pressing down and, you know, really getting that on there. Light, light pencil is fine. Another option, um, just cut strips of paper, of regular paper, just cut little squares and write the information on the little pieces of paper and then slip them with your photographs um, into the sleeves. And that way, it's not directly on the photograph itself. And so I have lots of examples for everyone to see. Another option are sticky notes, but ad adhesives over time do dry out, and so the sticky notes will fall off and that information is lost. So um, here's different size um, sleeves that you can use for your photographs. So you would insert your photograph and if you decide to do the little slip of paper, you can slip it right in the back. And so now um, someone looking at that photograph won't have to actually touch the photograph. It's a nice sturdy enclosure and they can just turn it just, around. Do they just call the slip cover or? These are, um, these are uh, plastic uh, sleeves, uh, but not just any plastic. Um, these are archival quality plastic, and um, the trademark company for that is uh, Mylar. It's Melanex. And so, again, on, on any of the vendors in your list, you can um, find those materials. You can go ahead and pass these around. And they come in all shapes and sizes for any size item that you have. There's even some for negative, for slides, as you'll see, and there's some for negatives as well. They sell well, these we rolls. The comic book stores. Oh yeah. Book <laughs> <laughs> comic book stores are a good place to go as well. 
Thank you, Mike. Well, everything has a, a shelf life. Yeah. Put inside of that. Uh, no, they'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, it'll it'll extend the life of, of the the negatives. Also, uh, labeling your boxes. Once you sleeved your stuff, you folded it. Um, also, too, some stuff says acid free, and that means archival. So, like, mm. Right? Like, yes and no. It's better to have acid free though. Yeah, acid and lignin free are the, the ones that you want to make sure that you have. And you know, it's like everything, you know, really read those labels. Just because it says acid free, it doesn't mean it's you know, archival. Um, when you label your boxes, either label both sides or label the one side and make sure that side is facing out. So you can immediately see, okay, well, this is box blah, blah, blah which contains, you know, I don't know, uh, my mom's pictures, you know, from 19, the 1960s. You know, so you'll be able to see that. It's immediately uh, visible. Um, for the labels, use something permanent, whether it's, you know, print them out on your computer or use a Sharpie um, and just stick them on. These are from one of our collections here, and I'll pass these around as well. And um, like I said, always include the name of your file. Dates are very important whenever you have them, even if they're approximate dates. Approximate dates are better than no dates, um, because sometimes things will end up in a repository like ours, and then we have to guess you know, based on all those things I had mentioned, whether it's a hairdo, a car, you know, a suit, a tie, you know, what ballpark year is this photograph from? And when you have numerous boxes, make sure you number them, like one of five, two of five, three of five. So that way, you know, they, there's a rhyme and reason to everything. And so again, um, you want to purchase preservation grade enclosures, the sleeves that I passed around, and um, you know, look for that Melnex or Mylar. Um, and another important thing is the, the sleeve should really match the size of the item. Because if you put like a tiny picture in one of those eight by 10 sleeves, that little picture is going to be shifting all over the place. And so really, you know, choose an appropriate sleeve for the item that you're going to um, put away. And, and like you saw, there's even these little, little tiny ones that you can put the small pictures. Um, or if there's multiple photographs that should be together, you'll see that there's um, some that accommodate two, three, four. There's, there's different things. Um, and so document boxes, or store, um, archival boxes, they come in all shapes and sizes and colors. Mm -hmm. This is the type of stuff we buy at Target, right? Not <laughs> I have a ton of these as well. Um, again, if it's something you're going to be accessing all the time, that you need it, you gotta have it, um, these are fine. But for your photographs, you know, you wanna preserve them for all those reasons we stated, these, are that great. Um, you should really invest um, in, in these types of boxes. And again, these should um, be, they should match the size of your items. And in some cases, it's better to have, and you can go ahead and pass these around as well. It's better to have flat storage. Um, in other cases, you'll want to use you know, upright a uh, document box. Like these are similar to that target box that I had here, but it's archival, you know, and your, you know, snapshots will fit nicely and snug. They won't shift. And so you could also buy something like that. These are available in like, if you check like art supply stores, you can get these locally. <laughs> 
Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Very tall person. And again, yes. You could. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, one of our collections, they, they did go that extra step and they were um, sleeving all their stuff in archival quality sleeves. And um, Raynal, sitting in the back, um, you know, went the extra mile to call the company and say, what type of sleeves are these? Are these archival? And he got the full rundown. And yes, they were. So yeah, that's, that's completely fine. But do you mean like a three ring binder? Yeah. The thing about three ring binders is you have to be careful um, that it's that the, the binder itself, that the vinyl that's wrapping around the cardboard that's making it, that stuff decomposes in about ten years. And it gets very gummy. So you cut, try to get just a plain cardboard one or paper one. Okay. So that brings me to my next point: optimal storage. And if you have optimal storage, then even when they are in like the binders or um, you know they're not in the sleeves but they're in a box they'll they'll last a, a long time and so that um, includes temperature humidity light and location and so temperature optimal should be between 65 and 70 70 is I think um, usually what we have in here <laughs> Um, so, so that, you know, just a nice cool, but not freezing, um, environment. Uh, humidity should be between 30 and 50 percent. And um, they sell little strips to measure humidity, but, I mean, who's, who has the time to do that? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> one easy, quick way to control humidity, believe it or not, are those charcoal filters that, like, aquariums use, or they sell them for your closets. Um, like a Target, you know, just pop one of those in your closet, you know, where you have your photographs or in those like back, you know, s like steamy rooms where you keep things. Like those absorb mo moisture and they absorb odors as well. So, uh, can you put them in those boxes? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't want to put the filters in the boxes, just in the environment, you know. So, if it's in a closet, just pop it in your closet. If it's in a room, just put one somewhere in the room. And you know, you, you change them out about every six weeks. And they're, and they're cheap. Um, light, uh, less is good, but none is better. So, I mean, the less um, direct sunlight that your photographs get, the better. Um, this type of lighting um, is not optimal. Um, so just, you know, keep, keep your photographs in a nice, you know, box, you know, away from direct sunlight. Um, I brought a sample from home. So I'm sure all of us have seen stuff like this. You know, it's been framed, it's got the tape all around with the sails on it. Um, if I were to remove this picture, it will have a square around it of mugre, of dirt, of, you know, just discoloration. That's what happens um, with sunlight. <laughs> and also, um, I, I mean, I remember when I took uh, preservation in library school, all of us went, <gasps> when uh, the professor said, you really shouldn't frame your pictures. But... Who's not going to frame their pictures, right? So what you should do is, you know, make a copy. You know, go to Walgreens, go to Costco, make a copy, and frame the copy. So that way, you you still get to frame your photographs, but you're preserving, you know, the the historical item. Yes. Is there any way to put something that absorbs moisture, or anything that, like this, on the back of a picture or something? Well, I mean, if if you've boxed it properly. No, I mean, if you have it framed. The thing about frames, like I said, I mean, they, they're, they're going to get a lot of light, you know, as you're switching that switch on and off, on and off all day. Um, there's a lot of pollutants in the environment. Also, you know, you turn on the air conditioner, especially depending where you live. If you live in the valley, it's hot and you have that thing going all summer. Um, 
in the winter, you have the heater going, you know, so it, it's not optimal to it's have no a... No coating or anything? No, no, there's there's no coating. Um, and then location. Avoid attics, basements, and garages. Have you noticed <laughs> that they get really, really hot, really, really cold, and, you know, in some cases, like basements, especially damp. Um, those are the worst. Also, putting your stuff by the water heaters or vents. Um, like Emma said, by, by your stove, la estufa, <laughs> like no. Uh, by the fridge. By food in general, that's not good. Um, and try not to stack heavy things on top of each other. Um, you know, if you can find a nice way to stack things, um, if you already have like shelving somewhere in your house or in your um, closet, I mean, you can, again, go to Walmart, go to Target, and I feel like I'm doing commercials for these stores. <laughs> um, you know, buy some, you know, shelving that you can, you know, put in, in your closet or something and, you know, just, you know, um, put things on the shelves. Never put anything on the floor because, let's say you have a leak in your house and your house floods or there's a hole in your roof or whatever, then all the stuff on the floor is going to get soaked and destroyed. Um, pests. Silverfish. Silverfish <laughs> love paper. Silverfish <laughs> love glue. So that's why you always find them uh, uh, books, paper photographs. Um, really just keep food away um, from you know any areas where you're keeping your photographs. Um, that's, that's the best. And you can always tell if there's critters in your stuff uh, when you find frass. That's the fancy word for insect droppings. And it'll just look like a bunch of black particles and it's not cool. So if you find that, you know you have pests and so you should probably do a little spring cleaning and uh, you know, tell everyone in your house, don't eat in this room. You know, this is where our legacy is. Um, mold. Some people think that any black um, spots are mold. No, not everything is mold. You can smell mold. Um, it, it's very strong. If you do detect mold on something, immediately take that away from everything else, separate it, and put it in a Ziploc bag. And go to your nearest archive, library, museum, historical society, anywhere where there's a librarian, an archivist, a curator, a someone, a conservationist, someone that can advise you as to next steps. You know, um, that might involve cleaning it or it might involve just taking it outside into a, vent a well ventilated area and taking a photograph of it um, or going to a scanner and you know scanning the item and then wiping it down with some Clorox wipes. Um, so again just make sure you separate it from uh, the rest of your stuff and you check everything else for you know signs of mold. The plastic won't make it worse? Some plastics uh, do. If they're not archival, they, they um, especially when it's... Zip -lock bag, it would. Well, this, this isn't long term. It would just be, you know, while you address the, the mold, the mold situation. Um, so are there any questions so far? What about negatives? Negative, same thing, you know, cool is best. Um, like I passed this around, these are for negatives. Um, and, and the same applies, you know, nice, dark, cool um, space. I, I think, you know, maybe this is one that we can give to our photographers on site. Um, I know that you can put your stuff in fridges, right? Uh, that's only color, color. Color negatives? Okay. But not like freezer, freezer, like no, fridge. No best to keep it cool. Black and white you could keep at room temperature actually. But Did, you don't can everyone hear? Oh, sorry. <laughs> like with, with black and white photographs you want to keep them in a room temperature maybe up to 68 to 70 degree like 73 whereas color photographs because they have more 
uh, chemicals to deteriorate, so you want to put those in like a, a cooler temperature room. Uh, best rooms are like, you know, if you go to those places like the storage units. Oh, those are horrible. Yeah. Because like, they get hot in the summer. Yeah, and the, it's sometimes steamy. the ACs do not work, so those like avoid those. So yeah. if you have like a small fridge, like you get those small fridges, like, you know, Walmart or anything, you could keep, uh, uh, as long as you put them in like a Ziploc bag or something, and then you put the print inside, then you fix, you don't get like the, the burn, freezer burn. The free oh. fridge burn. So. Mm. Now, a problem you'll notice uh, with negatives, particularly from the 70s, is the color will begin to shift or fade. Oh, yeah. And I've seen a number of collections where the prints are actually a better source of information than the negatives. And, uh, for whatever reason, they're a little more stable than the negatives, particularly from that time period. I had a picture of cards that um, went that way. It was like And I before I, before uh, it just totally disappeared, I took it to be like, I guess they digit, you know, digitized mm -hmm. it and it, they couldn't do the color again. Yeah. And it was only in black and white and they said the 70s they began to experiment with color in ways that we don't even know about and <laughs> it says, and, you know, it took some time for, you know, it to really work out so that we could perfect oh, yeah. it. yeah, and papers, I mean, a lot of my photographs are red now, you know, that my, my parents took when I was a little girl. Um, and I remember I had asked you when you started working here, like, why is that? And you said it had to do with the paper. Yeah, most yeah. of the papers from like 70s and 80s, they again were experimenting with different chemicals and properties. So depending on like uh, humidity or temperature change or mold or anything, the chemical, you, you'll start to notice that they'll go orange or red. Like even before then, like the color nowadays, it, like when they start to fade to, you'll notice like Polaroids fade. Those those badly. are horrible. Yeah. Just continue with the scanning. Is anyone else ready for scanning? Or mm. have we finished everyone? One. I'm doing the last batch. Just okay. Barbara. Yeah. yeah. We also a few of you um, have some images where there's writing on back. And we'll want to make sure we get a photocopy of that as well before you leave so that we can make sure that we have that. You may have written some of that information onto the input sheet, um, but it's useful to have that, uh, a document of that as well. I don't know that there's uh, a lot, but particularly a lot of the images from before the 1950s, people will tend to have written either at that time or retrospectively. Um, yeah, it'll say like for from, you know, con cariño or something. Um, but are there any other, like, nitty-gritty questions? I have a question about printing stuff out now, but I, I just get freaked out that, you know, you won't be able to use the digital stuff. And so if you get, whenever I print stuff in staples or wherever, the photographs just seem so cheap and not, like, is there anything you can do, any way to print those, like, old, I you know, like, that's a photograph, you know what I mean? That's the paper just feels... Is there anything you can do like that for things that are yeah. particularly and special to you? Like, <laughs> well, yeah, do you think that they use image to, like, um, yeah, that's why a lot of people learn how to scan, like, you know, when I personally uh, do reproductions, like, you scan it at a high quality, and then it's really going to, like, an art store or a photo store and asking them for really photo quality paper for reproductions, mm -hmm. and it can look exactly like that. Okay. But it's all like staples and all that. I mean, they choose, right. choose it's really cheap yeah. paper. Yeah. So it's all about the paper. Okay, because like it's just it seems paper. like there's no Kodak store anymore, or no. you know, <laughs> whatever you used to, wherever you used to go take your stuff to be developed. Well, no. So I just didn't know where. <coughs> where you the best take places stuff I found that print, like if you scan a really good quality um, paper or a print or anything, like um, Costco. Yeah. Well, Costco actually re does reproduce um, C prints. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, but. but but the thing about that that I've learned um, is the best way is inkjet. That's actually longevity now mm -hmm. that they've they've uh, progressed with that. So even though like the word inkjet sounds weird or when you see paper like that actually can last really good quality can last 100 to 200 years. Yeah, I mean still keeping at that quality of like you know storage and all that. But yeah. Yeah, because with these, like these type of, with this type of paper, this is a Kodak paper, this is RC, it's only good for like maybe 25 years if it's kept under proper storage, you know. With like the ink checks now, yeah, they're two, about 200 years. Well, and what's interesting too, negatives are also a lot more stable than photographs. 
So if you could take care of the negative, then you're pretty much set. And then you'll just. But if you take it digitally, that's my concern. Is like if you take it digitally and you have the. Like a digital file. Right. Like if you have a digital file. That you yeah, have inkjet study. is like the best way. As long as you have like with the the digital files, you have like the raw file, mm -hmm. and then you have like a, a high res JPEG, a high res um, TIFF. Mm -hmm. Then you have a low res. You just have them all saved. Then you and you have backups, mm -hmm. at least three. Then you're you're pretty much good to go. Yeah, sometimes it's well, just that's not what Harry really Harry did. Yeah. Yeah. Harry said that you have to. Well, you know, he my husband's a really good photographer. He scans the whatever, especially the old photos of his of his family that he did, and then he has the raw where he doesn't the the, the original one he yeah. doesn't touch it. He saves that. He said that's the most important thing is not to mess with the actual first um, uh, scan. Mm -hmm. It's a second when you know then you can alter, you could change. Like say there's like like this, for instance, this family photo has tape all the way around. So what, it, what Harry would do is he scan the whole thing and get rid of um, just by adding this color to that. Mm -hmm. you, you just you could actually make it look so good. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the whole thing is the the scanning and the and the and he goes like he'll go like really crazy on some of the um, the um, fine um, little points and just pixel by pixel mm -hmm. he'll change them and it's just amazing because when he prints it out he does print them out at Costco sometimes yeah. but, you know because you, you can get like 11 by 14 for like just a couple dollars there yeah. it's amazing yeah. but he also goes and uses a really high expensive black and white uh, photo lab because they're they're going out of business mm -hmm. I and mean, they're just like yeah. it's really they're, hard they're to find them out. yeah mm -hmm. so he goes this Larry's photo lab it's like a, he goes really far away to go get those black and white prints done, but those are for like museum quality photos. On, so. on that note, Barbara, <laughs> would you um, like to say a few words on about, you know, oh. your interest in, you know, documenting sure. your family and... Okay, um, well, t a couple years ago my mother passed away mm -hmm. and my sisters and I had the um, crazy task of going through all the um, And this is my mother's mother. And I said, that's who I look like. <laughs> I was trying to think like, I don't look like anyone in the family. <laughs> but um, but um, anyway, but it's interesting because then I went to El Paso, Texas, where I was born, and I, I took a tape recorder and I, I interviewed um, family members that I had, I never met them. These are my second and third cousins. And so I t the tape recorder was good because one of them, one of them uh, identified, this is so weird, this is, um, a family member I've never I never even knew about, and she's wearing the same dress. Wow. My grandma is wearing the same dress, so you, it's really down. good. It's good to have a magnifying <laughs> glass when you're looking at all these old photos, because then you'll find like different. Um, we, I found see this. There's an address in the back. It mm -hmm. says it's a company, and I took a. Too bad I don't have it. I forgot. It. It's the address is on here, and so I found that location. It no longer exists, of course. There's a building that, there now, but I was photographed right in front of it, exactly the same mm -hmm. spot. It, it was really interesting to find out. And then my mother, where my mother grew up in, in um, this one street, um, in all the family photos, there's a little. You can see the mailbox, and it says 341 uh, Estrella Street. And that's where my mother grew up, and so I went there, and that building was torn down too. So it's interesting to go back and, and but the family members getting the information from the family members is so important. Having them talk about like there's some things I, about my mother that I never knew, and they were it was it got really personal, and they were like telling me all these things I never heard about my mother, and it was it was uh, it was pretty amazing to to get that information. And then I went to um, UTEP. They have uh, the the research um, library there is doing a, um, well, they're compiling also the same thing you, they're doing here, you know, compiling family histories and all that. And my grandfather lived on the yeah, the part of Mexico where they gave it back to, what was it called? The, the Chamisal area where they always get given back to Mexico, this land. But my grandfather's property was on the side that's now Mexico. So they gave, the, all the people that were displaced, they gave them uh, money, of course, to move and all that. But the librarian had, um, digital files on uh, photographs of all the families. That was really cool to get that. So I, I, I was, uh, I spent like uh, three weeks in El Paso without my daughter, it was great. <laughs> just, <kidding. laughs> you know, just to like, um, I couldn't believe it. Huh? I know, but it was, it was so much, uh, you can get, it's addictive to start yeah, finding your family yeah. history. Like I, I didn't know, cause this is my grandmother and this was in a little tiny uh, thing, in a little tiny photo and Harry took a, he, he retook the photograph. 
he didn't scan this. He retook the photo. He reshot it. And and uh, and because it was in a really this some kind of tar. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, it was some glass like a, a covering. And and I thought, oh my God, it's gonna damage it. You know, so um. So that that looks really good. It looks just like the actual mm -hmm. photo. That had and a it, life on top. It, it had a, it had a, those little pendant. Yeah, it's like things. it was about this small, and it was a, 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 a glass covering, and it, but it was sealed with this. It took me a long time to make sure. I had to take it off with an exacto. Do something like that, and I keep getting reflection no matter which oh, way. Oh yeah, but you have to take have the to glass take it off. off. Okay. Yeah, but you have to be really careful because I, I was careful not to to actually ruin the, the photo yeah. itself. Wow. And um, oh. and see, the, and then this Take is a photograph. <coughs> this is my grandfather right here. This is oh, the, wow. the year is 1911. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Yeah. And um, it looks just like my brother. You know, what? I have a picture yeah. I of my father at nine. Oh, in, oh, in, in nine Mexico, years old. And in like, in 1918. Uh, oh, and wow. It's like that. So you know, the same. This, I'm not sure. How oh, really? So this is 1911. Since 1911. Yeah, it's, it, it, and, and what I what we did is we scanned the back too. Uh -huh. So you know you were saying so you because sometimes I was really upset about half the photographs that I, that I inherited they had no information about the family member, and that was real. That's why it was good to bring them back physically to El Paso and say, I don't know who this is, and um, we, it's really cool. And one of my this is um this is from the time period is really old. It has a date on this one, 1904. This is 1904. I like the clothes. <laughs> this is my great 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 aunt. Wow. So she was the yeah. It's really crazy. It's I, it's it's. Uh, but we 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 have all the information. I I can't believe I forgot the um the. I did a printout of our family tree and, and all that information. Yeah, it's really interesting yeah, to, to do that. And then I was going to ask um, Lizette for some advice about how to take care of this photo. This is a Casa Sola photograph um, that was taken in El Paso of my mother on her prom, in her prom dress. Oh. And um, isn't that amazing? It's, and I didn't know about this photograph. I know, I think it's a pretty good um, uh, color uh, rendition. I mean, what is it called? Uh, those are hand colors. Those are hand they would, colors. They would print them and then go back. On and the black and white photo. Yeah. yeah. What, what kind of photo is it called? It's a Casa Sola, which, which was a, the Casa Sola was a very famous oh. um, photo what studio. Is that? Oh, um, you know, oh she, uh, she's 49. passed away. No, it's like, no, uh, no it's, it's like in, let's see, she got married in 50, um, 1953. So it must have been like, yeah, towards the end of the 40s, the 40s. Yeah, 49, I was going to say, because my mother didn't go to her prom, and she's got a picture of her best friend, and, oh, really? and she's in that dress, and she's standing there with a pedestal, and it's 49. That color oh, wow. Is 49. Well, well, I think that I, I'm really worried about some part of this, because I don't know what spilled on here. There's like the little drops in it, and so Harry's going to rescan on this for me, and then, uh, you know, to take out this, just from uh, the Photoshop. We put it into Photoshop. And, uh, and he, he told me that, to stress to you that it's important not to ever, once you do the original scan, don't mess with that original scan. You make duplicates of that, and then you mess with those duplicates. Yeah. You know, and because he said a lot of people make the mistake of altering the, uh, second, the, mm -hmm. the original image. But, um, but with this thing, I, you know, this, this board is actually falling apart. I can feel it, it's ready to go. It's got acid in it probably, and, um, but it's such a cool photo, I just, I, I mean, Oh, go ahead. What? When you scan, are you supposed to scan at a particular resolution? Yeah, I, uh, actually, Harry, I talked to a consultant. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't That's do exciting. the scan. He does the scan. But um, no, he said to scan to scan at the highest resolution, twelve hundred or twenty four hundred. Is that like photo people? Yeah. Photo people. <laughs> <laughs> it's real slow. He said it takes longer, of course. Yeah, but then you get a really good. Uh, That's your guess. Huh? You get all Hover high the scanner can go. Yeah, he and then he said he said yeah to save it as a um, as a source file to save it as a source file and then make duplicates and change it to do the work and label it work like a working file. So you know that you that's your master. Right. Yeah. yeah, and then as he says, he, he made, well, you know, he's been doing photography for, for a long time, so he's made a lot of mistakes. He, the, the slides he does right now, he does, he never puts them in, the, in those, uh, those slide containers anymore. You know why? Because every time you put it in and take it out, it, there's chances of scratching them. And a lot of Harry's photos that were used for the Osco show, uh, when they blew them up, they saw the, scr the scratches on the negatives, on the slides. 
So they're like kind of like negatives, you know. And uh, he really regrets doing that, putting them in those in the slide holders. When you say slide holders, you mean the, the, the sleeves? No, the so sleeves. Like these. Yeah, he, he he suggests not doing that. So what does he? Where does he, he puts them in boxes. One, one there are are uh, are uh, archival boxes. He puts them in there. So it was batched, but but then how do you? So they won't stick to each other? Yeah. No, they won't because the, 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 the there's a frame. Um, the space 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 yeah. But it goes back to that issue of what are you planning to use frequently yeah. and what are you planning to not use. And so, I mean, if you're just going to store them and not do anything with them, then this is fine. But yeah, definitely, like in the case of Harry, who's an artist and a photographer, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah about the boxes. My great great grandparents they were in Mexico, they had there were two pieces of picture that so appear because they've been torn, but they were whole. And they had them put together for me, they would digitize them, they scan them. They gave me once they to put them together, they gave me three copies of that digitized. Are they all originals or is one of them the original and the other two are copies? Oh, that's a good question. No, they're probably originals. What, they're, 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 are, are I mean, each one of them. Names? That's what she was asking. Yeah, yeah, she was yeah, okay. yeah they're, if they're usually, there's different file names. Yeah. And like, usually, well, you can only really scan at a tip. So usually the tip is the original. And then JPEG, oh. they get, because most people, their computers, well, like maybe, if, if you have a Mac, you can, but if you have PCs, most PCs can't read tips. It's um, great. Yeah, so that's why they give JPEGs for like the math club, like most people who scan them at tips. Okay. So the two of them are probably copies. Yeah. Okay. But they're not necessarily marked that way. I might have to go back on that. It's just, it's all in the file. I mean, okay. All right. Yeah. So, anyway, but it's just, I just want to encourage everybody to, to, to interview, like, um, you know, your relatives that are alive right now because you never know what's going to happen. My mother died unexpectedly of a stroke and so I feel really bad I'm really happy that I, I tape recorded her um, on an interview for a class at Cal Arts. <laughs> my was, mother uh, you know but um, <laughs> oh you know but I told my mom it was just it was just for a class like, when I was doing my LFA I took a class on family history but she told me I have and, um, all the oral history I mean I have it oh, I have stories written and she told me since I was a little girl but she, oh you know even when she got older she said no and it was all it was almost as if you know, she was. She knew she was going to become part of that history, and it was oh. too scary for her. You know, wow. to have closure on it. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like yeah, some people don't want to. Yeah, they're, they get uncomfortable yeah. with yeah. the with the but, tape. With the yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But if you say it's just for your own personal use to assure them well, that she it's knew not it because going I had it written down. Go any further, you know what I mean? People know, get little had it all. <laughs> had the family tree all. Drawn but it's out, a good excuse you know. to have it as a class project. <laughs> yeah, that's why I told my mom it, it was a class excuse. project, and actually yeah. it was a class project because it, 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 yeah, it was. A, we were supposed yeah. to do. Um, I forget the, mm -hmm. the woman who taught the class. She's a really well known photographer. Um, I think Pat Ward Williams. I think that was her. She anyway. The, I, I did this thing called, you know, everybody in my family was doing the, the Trivial Pursuit games. I never was one of those. I never liked that. No. Um, those kind of games. You sit down every night and do these goofy games. But um, <laughs> what, what I did is I took the Trivial Pursuit idea and made a, a, a family photos, like my mom's wedding picture. That's cool. And then on the back it says who the groom was, who the priest was. It was real crazy and for me, all the details. Yeah, yeah. And I got that from directly from her because she yeah. said, who gave you away? And, and, and that was also disputed. I had someone else say, uh, one of them said that her father um, uh, walked my mother down, gave my mother away in the, at the wedding. And the other, there was another cousin who said, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, photo thing was, the photo was really great because we found the photos. And you know, said, hey, that's my. <laughs> totally the truth. <laughs> yeah. So photos really do um, yeah, say a lot. Cool. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. But I mean, you know, you brought up a good point. You know, memory is relative. You know, we all remember yeah. things Selective. differently. Yeah. Even with photographs in front of you, you're like, no, 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 así no fue. You know, so the more eyes you get on something, the better. Yeah, um, I think it's just great. Exactly. Do. You know, the reason why we did this is, you know, no one can describe yourself better than you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the amount of detail that you put into a photograph will ensure access later. Yeah. You know, because people search on, you know, using, you know, particular, you know, keywords, whether it's a car yeah. or a neighborhood 
or um, a song or you know what a high school whatever you know but you know just get as many eyes as you can on a photograph and document as much of the information you get from every person as possible. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like you're an attorney investigating the case, you know, getting all the evidence, yeah. you know. It's really, it's, I, it's really important to do it to, to yeah. like even just having conversations, like if you have a conversation with someone, someone who doesn't want to get that information, you can go home and write that information down. You know, I, I think it's important. I think it's important for not just for your family, but your, you know, your kids' kids. And yeah. I, I, I was doing it for my daughter so yeah. that she has access to all that information. Yeah. And you know what's really interesting, though, for, uh, what I think is really important, especially because I'm a cancer survivor, is that I did I did a separate uh, a family um, health history. Oh. Like, I, I couldn't believe how many people died in the, in the, in the early uh, 19th century. People were dying of this one. It was consistent with all, all over the place. Um, they were dying of a... A medical condition that involves some kind of infection in your stomach and it was a weird term I forget mm. the term but I looked it up and they said it was just super common because people were working in the, in the silver industry or they were working in, in yeah. factories and that so people mm. contracted those kind yeah. of illnesses but it was uh, really it's really uh, that's I mean you could look at family history in terms of photos and I use a lot of photos in my artwork but I think it's also good to document your your health history so yeah. it, you know, so your kids can have that. Um, but it's just really exciting to do. It. I I really got into it. I was just like, you know, I'm so, addicted to it now. So I mean, I just wanted to. Um, we just wanted to thank everyone for coming. And um, we did. Um, we get some catering, and so we want you to be able to have a chance to mingle and and eat. Well, and you know, um, that one. you know, she's more stories. It actually like it kind of looks oh. like that. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is that grandkids are really much easier to get an older person to, to share their life history than with their own kids. <laughs> I, I put a lot, like Joan mentioned, I put a lot of uh, the, the pictures on the internet. And then I have cousins put other pictures and they're all coming out. But uh, also, like, I put a picture a couple months ago of my dad in uniform when he got out of the Navy after World War II. And then I'm getting all kinds of stuff from people like uh, Sergio Hernandez. This is what this insignia on his uniform yeah. is. It must have been right after oh, he wow. said, this man, he did this, and he was in this corps, and he was boom, 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 boom. And all of a sudden, from the Internet, I got all these things where I put my, uh, my grandmother's wedding picture and then all kinds of people are commenting on the dress and this and that you learn you, you pick up stuff you know it's, the, that's it's, a, it's a lot of fun sometimes uh, it's not so much fun when you do that uh, proactively they call it crowdsourcing because you're trying to basically use um, a kind of wide range of people to fill in the gaps mm -hmm. for you I think what's really critical is the next step is to make sure that the, all of that information is on a searchable platform so that people can then come in and if they're looking for something about a particular object or a particular moment, they will find the image as well. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook is not that great in terms of zeroing in. If I, I know to go to your, your page, and I know if I go through that, I'll find lots of great <laughs> stuff. But somebody just Googling that won't necessarily yeah. find that. And I think that's, that's part of the, the challenge, I think, of the digital environment, is making sure that the searchability right. is there. And, and there's no... There's no, uh, I think, limit to redundancy because um, it, it's all zeros and ones, but you want to make sure that it's out there and, and people come to it from as many angles as possible. Well, now, now there's like, um, there's Ancestry.com, which is, mm -hmm. you, always just, you have to go on that, but my sister was a member of that. I mean, she, she had to pay for that and all that, but there was a free uh, search engine called FamilySearch.org, mm -hmm. and what's really wonderful about that is that it's connected to the Mormon whatever oh, that archives the and then, it, it, the I, I found yes. more than she did uh -huh. on, the, on the free one yeah. and then you could download yeah. the documents right. you, know, <laughs> you know how much right. a document cost? it's like 13 dollars yeah. or mm -hmm. and then it adds up because yeah. when i was in el paso i went yeah. to the courthouse and i got 
death certificates and birth certificates and marriage certificates, and it, it adds up a lot. So this search engine is wonderful. <laughs> you can, and then, and then uh, it's called FamilySearch.org, and then they have uh, other sites where you can go to it, and someone with the same name, or you know, there's like a, you know, a lot of the Carrascos came from Miyoki, Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, which I found out through doing all this um, research, but but other people posted. I'm looking for someone who, who you know, another relative with the same name. It's pretty amazing, you know. You can connect a, a lot of ways through those search engines. Well, if you do have some images with text in the back, make sure that we are able to get a photocopy of them. Um, <laughs> you can get her back. Okay, or uh, Mike, or I'm really fortunate to have some students through the uh, uh, Getty Undergraduate Minority Internship who are experts in photography, and along with Jenny, who's a fine art photographer, um, really able to bring a high degree of expertise about uh, uh, film stock, paper, uh, as well as we found out from Chris uh, Velasco, uh, uh, being able to date fashion within about six months. <laughs> and so we've been able to fill in a lot of information where we don't really have access to the people that created the uh, uh, collection. So this has been a, this is part of a summer uh, program that we've been part of for the, probably the last eight years that really helps. Uh, Chris has stayed on and uh, he and I are actually going to be processing a fairly heavy, photo heavy uh, collection over the summer, uh, helping to make that available. So. We really appreciate you coming out and being part of this. We hope that uh, you'll stay in touch with us and that we'll be able to just see this as a starting point to broadening the range of materials we have uh, for families. As Barbara mentioned, uh, the photographs serve a historical function, but you never know. It's just get putting material out there that people can make use of. These images you see behind you are done by an artist named Sandra de la Losa. They are based on slides that we have, the Nancy Tovar slide collection based on slides in which she, she took of murals in East LA in the 1970s. And what Sandra did is that she was the first person to go through this collection and realize that the history of the mural movement wasn't quite accurate because it wasn't taking into account what people in the community did when they had a chance to make their own murals. And it wasn't necessarily didactic or political uh, work. And she took little incidental elements of these murals and turned them into her own artwork as part of an ongoing dialogue about the Chicano mural movement, both the local aspects of it and the political aspects, and what's happening today with the mural moratorium, where the generation after her, she's in her 40s, the kids in her 20s that want to be public artists don't have access to walls. And so she wanted to create a three-generation dialogue, but this comes out of somebody spending several weeks going through a photo archive. So you never know the outcomes. This is producing new art. It's producing a new uh, political moment in culture of uh, showing how three generations are connected to each other. Uh, but through her essay, which she ended up writing, we're getting a slightly different history of the mural movement than the one that's driven by the more didactic uh, work connected with organizations, which is an important part of the history. But it's only one part of the history. Uh, and, and this allows people to come back and say, I, I don't want to see this because I'm an artist. I want to see this because I want to reproduce the historical research she did looking at this photo collection. So again, thank you all for coming out. We do have some food out on our uh, patio. Hopefully this will continue. And uh, uh, do make sure that, um, you know, that Lizette has a chance to kind of uh, yeah, get make a uh, touch base with you. She's yeah. always here, except when she's not. <laughs> As with all of us. Uh, we, have, we have Mike, Mike Stone here, who's our archives manager. Uh, and we have Chris Velasco, and now I'm blanking on our photo. Star Montana. So, She's star. Yes, star. <laughs> star. Um, star. As well as the rest of our staff, we have uh, Renaud uh, Yen, who's a, a researcher, and he's actually he's spending a lot of time helping us process a collection related to a society for Chicano and Native American scientists. Um, and he's been part of an effort to make sure that that history kind of works its way. Uh, into public view. So uh, thank you all for coming out. We hope that you will continue to be part of our efforts here. Thank you. If anyone wants a card, um, so this is the transfer zone. How funny that I can pass around. Yes.